But just just so that if George is watching, remember counting counting blue cars. You know that specific part after the first chorus, going into the second verse, where you just guy where you just sustain on on B. Yeah. Right. Right. And then. Yeah. And it's got the drum break. Right. Ah. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Tasty. Yeah, that that whole thing. I just, I, you know, How, I just, was it was it by accident or was that like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna stay on B because the chord, the, the verse is gonna start on B, but I'll just stay there and you do something. I don't know, but when I heard that song for the first time, I'm like, ah, they landed on the one. Okay, let's see where this is gonna go. Right. And then I heard the drum, the drums go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that I mean. Do you remember how how that? I re- I remember the day. I remember the day in the studio, our little rehearsal spot that we had. That was an old plumbing, a plumber's place or something in Santa Barbara. That you know, it was just a cinder block room, no larger than this. And you know, uh, that one, George will say, "Oh yeah, you never would have come up with that." And he <laughs> said that to me. But in all honesty, there was a lot of communication. Mm. There was a lot of words there was some communication between us on that drum part and stuff and he has also said to me it's bit i wouldn't have played it like that really you know, like that's busier than i would have wanted to do i would have laid into it right, more or right. something he he has said things like that over the years too that he wouldn't have necessarily approached it that way but you know it's but it, it it's very much it 100 percent him that displacing the beat like that right there and stuff is just like that's just what what he does. Which is why which is why when I hear somebody cover counting blue cars, I'm always looking at that part. I am too. If that person doesn't nail it's it the never way it's quite right either. Is uh, the drum beat in, in general, I mean, and it's okay for, for cover bands to approach things the mm-hmm. way that they want to. You gotta play what feels natural to yeah. you. But but nine times out of the ten out of ten the drummer is not approaching that groove the same way. Right. And a lot of times the, the guitar player, you know, the relationship between the guitar and the bass is weird on that song too, where the bass dis- da, 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 And then he goes, yeah. Yeah, well, the bass is descending mm-hmm. and, and the guitar uh, line is actually is uh, ascending. Ascending so like, a, like a drone kind of... Yes, there's, there's a drone to it as well, but I'm playing G over yes. where the guitar is yes. playing D. Yes. And so it creates this weird fifth yes. tension that's right there. And what Rodney and I were trying to do was, again, we were just kids trying to emulate another, another band. We were trying to learn another song by a band called Catherine Wheel okay. from, from England. And they had a song called Crank that was on the... On the, on the <laughs> you know that, Michael? And um, so that song is on on the Chrome album, and we just we had heard it on the radio, and we're trying to kind of like figure out how they right. were making that sound, and we just found our own chord progression, and then, yeah. and then Jr. again opened up his lyric books to something that was called God, it wasn't called Counting Bukars, it just says God in his lyric book, it's just working title, and just started feeling his way through it ham and eggsing it as we used to call yeah, it yeah yeah you know, just, just putting placeholder lyrics yeah, and just placeholder lyrics mm-hmm. you know where they need to be and, and getting us through it but you know that's another great example of like when the band was really firing on all cylinders like everybody's just like contributing something to the now when you guys made um the first album mm-hmm. you guys were not signed yeah we were you were signed. oh yeah yeah so it's funny because you know in the 90s like it became this lame thing that if you were an alternative act, if you were a new rock act, you had to come from this credibility. You had to have previously released indie, indie released mm. records, uh, a grassroots following in place. And this was the early stages of live nations 360. And, and we didn't have, we didn't have any of that. We didn't like tell the West Brocket, they had 50,000 names on their uh, email right. list. And, you know, they, they had sold thousands of, records on their own independently we were basically around as dish slash dishwalla because we threw the walla on there 18 months before we got a deal so it wasn't some 
really, you know, there was the decade before that of hard work, but Dish Walla itself really was around a short time, but we were just focused. And that that's the big that's thing the that word, no? I'd say to any young artists that are out there listening is that it just takes everybody on the same page focused, get off work every day, go to band practice, yeah. and just get that thing so rock solid that yes. it's undeniable. And the songs reworked and reworked. We re-recorded the demos three times, same songs. You know, it wasn't until the third time around doing some of these songs that, that and we weeded them out too. We had other songs that we dropped along the way um, after getting some direction from other people, but we did have good people giving us direction along the way too. Mm -hmm. 